to us at um, I'd like to thank everyone for being here today and allowing us to just share a very small glimpse of what life has been like for us for the last nine months. So I hope you don't mind church finishing at one o'clock tonight. That's, it's just a small bit. I'm just kidding. Um, so as you are aware, my family and I, we were called by God to go over to um, South Sudan at the beginning of May last year is when we left Mount Isa and we got back to Mount Isa unexpectedly nine months later. We were only meant to go for three, but um, in hindsight, God answered prayers and we were able to extend our trip longer, but um, otherwise, we thank you very much for joining us on our journey and continually keeping us in our prayers, no matter where God led us. So we really do thank you and we are so grateful that we can have this time to share with you and encourage you with what God is doing um, over in South Sudan. So um, I hope you enjoy the worship today. We've got a few extra new songs that have really helped us on our journey that we've loved to be able to share with you. Um, so yeah, just bear with me as well. I'm not very confident. So. Um, yeah, if you'd like to join with us in prayer, uh, sorry, in singing. Um, please stand.
Heavenly Father, we just do welcome you here today. We thank you that um, we can so openly and freely come and worship your name, Lord. Lord, I just ask that um, your name will be glorified above all else, Lord. I just ask that um, we can be a true witness to the incredible things that you're doing all over the world, Lord. And we just ask that you be an encouragement to um, our family here at Mount Isa. And we just ask that... Um, they will yeah, continue to um, uphold Indeed and Truth Ministries and uh, the whole of Tonge just in their prayers, Lord, as they hear a bit about what you're doing over there, Lord. We just ask this all in your name, Jesus. Amen. All right, you can be seated. I've just got a couple of announcements. Uh, we are still in need of volunteers for greeting at the door. Um, and for Sunshine Corner leaders to help out on Sunday, whether it be just going up and being a pair of eyes or leading a session. Um, I'm, if you need to speak to anyone, speak to Amanda Smart, who is not here today. Um, or you can talk to Tim or Tanis, who are not also here. not here. But just send an email through to the church and we'll be in contact with you. Um, in, if you are, are not receiving our church life emails and you would like to, please um, also either email the office or let Tim know that you'd like to be added to the database to be able to receive our weekly updates. Um, members meeting minutes get sent out as well. Leaders meeting minutes get sent out as well. So if you'd like to keep up to date with what's going on in the church, just let Tim know and he will add you to the database. Um, there will be no Sunday school or junior church today as we would like to invite the kids to stay and hear about what's been happening in Tonge as well. Um, ladies, put it in your calendars. The 12th of March, we are having our first ladies event for the year. Um, again, it will be a South Sudan night, so I am more than happy to answer questions and be available for the night and just share more in-depth testimonies of things that are maybe a bit PG rated <laughs> for church so um, if you'd like to hear more about what is happening um, within the women's ministries in Tonge um, and within the hospital and any questions you might like to ask come along um, on the 12th of March we'll have more details to come but put it on your calendars now and we're also uh, Tuesday the 1st of March is men's hangar night um, if you need any more info, come and see Gary. He's up the back, and it's uh, $10 for apparently the best burgers in Man Isa. So, oh, okay, second best because Gary's not on the barbecues today, <laughs> this week. Um, so, yeah, more info. Grab Gary afterwards, and he will be more than happy to let you know anything. Um, also, we are in need of leaders for our Girls and Boys Brigade Ministries. So if God's putting that on your heart to um, step up and help out with those ministries, um, see Jeanette Lewis again or Gary. So Jeanette for Girls Brigade, Gary for Boys Brigade, just, just to case. clarify. <laughs> um, so yeah, that's all the announcements for today. And oh, I forgot to check. Is anyone prepared for the offering? No, oh, yep, awesome. Yeah. Thanks, Ms. Duns. So during this next song, I um, there is a story I'd like to share with this song, but we'll sing the song first, and I'll let you know the meaning of this song after. So if you'd like to join with us, we're going to sing One Day now.
Francis can take a seat if you'd like. I don't know if I'm going to get through this next bit. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> that song has significance. Yeah. Thank you. Um. As you're probably all aware, we had one of the biggest scares of our life. <laughs> Thought I could wing it, but <laughs> all right. So yeah, as you're probably aware, we had um, a pretty big health scare with Ben, and. One thing I asked him after it had all gone through, I'm like, what was going through your head when you were on the brink of death? And he was like, really? All that kept coming to my mind was the, the song, the bridge from the song, you're more than enough for me. So all I kept saying was, God, you're more than enough for me. So really, typically, that day started out as any other. Um... We had um, a health care previous while we were in Juba and Ben woke up, he just woke up. He had done nothing different and he's like, my tongue is really swollen, like, I am feeling really weird in my, in my hands. And so we contacted um, Jono and Destiny back in Tonj and he was like, you got to get this medicine on board, this medicine on board. but." Anaphylaxis isn't a big thing they really see over in Tonsha or even in South Sudan. So they don't understand the seriousness of what anaphylaxis is. And we'd contact our um, guy that we knew in Juba and like, we need to get these medicines on board right away. But he was out somewhere and goes, okay, I've just got to finish this and then um, I'll, I'll get them. Like, no, it's, it's pressing. We need you to do this now for us. Um, and we went to the office uh, in at the accommodation where we were staying. Like we need to get to the hospital, um, and they're like, "Well, it's it's only for emergencies on Sunday." And like this this is an emergency. We we need to get into the hospital. His airways are closing up, and he's struggling to breathe. And they said, "Well, all of our drivers are out at the moment. We we can't get him to the hospital." I'm like, "We'll find someone. We need to get them." So. Again, they're calling taxi drivers and they're like, we've just got a guest here that's a bit unwell. They need to get to the hospital. I'm like, he's, he's dying. We need to get him to the hospital. So we put the call out for prayer and within minutes, his tongue had stopped swelling. He was able to breathe again and his rashes had gone down and he was feeling normal again. So praise God, he was healed and that was a great testimony to, to the amazing things God was doing. Unbeknownst to us, it was probably just an underlying issue that wasn't quite right with Ben. So a couple months had gone by and we were back in Tonj now and again, Ben had just been working all morning, doing nothing out of the ordinary, nothing that he hadn't been doing already. And he goes, I've got that feeling in my hands again. Um, my hands are starting to burn and... My mouth is starting to swell. I'm like, okay, well, head over to the hospital. We've got one here. Why don't you use it? So um, he went. And I just thought it was going to be the same again. He's going to be healed. He's in the right place. Nothing's going to happen. Um, so we just continued on with our school day, doing the work we needed to. And next thing, the field director came, came over. And he's like, Sarah, we need to go over to the hospital and pray for Ben. I'm like, of course we do. We're on a mission hospital we pray for our patients let's go come on kids let's go pray for daddy and like, oh but we want to do this school work it's really fun i'm like come on it's the right thing to do let's go pray for dad um so we walk over to the hospital and we were greeted to a massive crowd of people 
like, oh, what's going on over here? Surely this can't be for Ben. And we approach the hospital. They're all telling us, go away, go away. There's too many people here, go away. But the other people that knew us are dragging us into the hospital. And we walk in. And Ben's there lying on a bed. He had lines coming out everywhere, oxygen, and was barely conscious. I was like, what happened? This didn't happen last time. He was healed. Why is he down here? And Jono and the doctors, they're there pumping as much fluids through him as possible. I think they went through like what, 500 mils in 10 minutes or something. They're just squeezing it through all the while. Ben's just there, barely alive. And the kids, the kids were such troopers. They got there and they were just laying our hands on Dad. And they just were believing for the miracle for him to be saved. And Jono just got to the point where he's like, we can't do anything else. This is in God's hands now. And he was also like on the brink because the last time he had seen this happen, his patient didn't make it. And um, they would put adrenaline through his leg and it didn't work. And so they did another... Uh, vial of adrenaline straight in his vein which Jono said we never do this to conscious patients because it's the most excruciating pain that a person can feel and I guess that's what Ben can testify for that it was very painful he said he just felt like all the blood was just pulled from every part of his body just to go straight to his heart and praise God because he is here with us today and we honestly believe that if it wasn't for God in that moment and for our prayers that um, he wouldn't be here because it was, it was a very tough day. But thank God for, for his miracles. So, and we thank you also for all your prayers um, during that time because... We were here, we're here, we're back to, to declare the amazing things God's doing. Um, so, moving on, I'll also just give you guys just a brief rundown. Can I please get the PowerPoint of what Tonj life looked like for us? So, in case you don't know where Tonj is, it's in Africa, on the east side of Africa. So, there's Sudan, South Sudan there. Next slide. So South Sudan is um, a landlocked country. It borders Sudan, the Democratic Republic of the Congo, Uganda, Kenya, and Ethiopia. So our next biggest city closest to us is a town called Wau. Um, that red dot down the bottom is um, Tonj. So this is an aerial view of Tonj. So that is the city this strip here that's the air strip and in the wet season this is all underwater so this is the river that if you followed our journey this is where we'd go bridge jumping or where we did all our baptisms and all that was down by this river um, it's also a branch of the Nile River so it's always got water in it and it's always so that's a, a great thing for for Tonj to have um, so on this map, the compound is just here, if it's going to click. So yeah, that's where the compound is. Um, this is where we'd constantly go for walks down here. We'd go bridge jumping here. Um, while we were there, it was during the wet season, so it was much, much greener, and there was crops that were cultivated all over. So all through here would just be sorghum stalks as high as the roof like it was a beautiful time to be there um so the compound just in case you're wanting to know oops too far so this is predominantly what the compound looks like so we lived in oh, sorry we lived in this little block for the first few months and then we moved over into Susie's house once she went back to America. Um, the McLeods, who's the other family that we also support, they, this is their house back here. 
Um, then we've got our other team rooms here and here, and this building here was being reconstructed while we were there. Um, our kitchen was over here, um, and our laundry was over here, um, and our toilets and shower block was over here. So we didn't have the luxury of having everything in one place until we went to Susie's house. So that was a blessing that we were able to move over and not have to get woken up at three o'clock every morning to go for a walk <laughs> over to the toilet. Um, so the hospital is actually, this whole area is owned by Indeed and Truth Ministries. So the hospital is over here. So the outpatients department, which is open seven days a week, they see hundreds of patients a day. Um, they come in through here and then the maternity unit is at this end. So they do antenatal clinics there, all their deliveries. And if we need to have inpatients, they come over here to the ward where we have 26 beds. Um, there's three isolation rooms. One half is for maternity and the other half is for paediatrics. Um, but majority of the time we were there. I think at one point we had 11 neonate babies that were born months too early so and only four incubators so it was very hard to pick and choose who were the most in need often we would have two babies to one incubator um, the administration block is here where we did devotions and youth group was in this building here and this is where the pastor's office is now so that's pretty much um, what, where we lived for the last six months. Um, yeah, and they've just acquired, just before we left, they've just bought this block of land here and they're starting to build an x-ray room. So that's very exciting for the ministry. So thank you, Nathaniel. We can be done with that. Um, and just one more thing that I was also um, heavily involved in was the youth group there. So we met um, once a fortnight, we would have uh, a Bible teaching. They'd call it Bible training, so either way is the same thing. Um, we'd meet for a game of sports, whether it be volleyball, soccer, um, or even just whatever they could come up with. They had foosball tables, we'd do dance some weeks. So um, they were always very enthusiastic and always eager to come along for that. Um, and then we would sit for an hour where we would do our message and then we would break into small groups, boys and girls, and then we'd go more in depth and ask questions and they would um, answer or we'd have prayer time. So we always had a really good turnout. Um, during the harvest was a bit down, but we always had about anywhere from 30 to 100 kids. So while we were there, well, the senior pastor had a vision for the youth group. He really wanted to do a youth conference. And um, we were just very, 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 very blessed by our supporters. And um, God gave us the funds to be able to help support um, this youth conference. And so Destiny and I sat down with the senior pastor and a couple of other leaders and like, when do we want to do this? And like, okay, well... Harvest is going to be here, then there's school exams, and then there's going to be the floods coming. So if we want to do this, we've got two weeks to plan it. I'm like, two weeks to plan a youth conference? Okay. So thinking we had such little time, we thought we'd only be able to cater for like 100, 150 people max. Um, but word got out, and we organised the conference within two weeks, and we rocked up early the first day, not expecting to have anybody there and there would have easily been about already 100, 150 people there waiting for the conference to start before we'd even gotten there. I'm like, where are all these people coming from? And by the time we were ready to start, there would have easily been double what we had expected, three to 400 people. I'm like, what? We have not catered for this. We're not prepared for this. How are we gonna feed all these people? We've, we've, put it, we've only given us enough money We've already paid for the meat. There's By the time the conference starts, the meat in the market's already all gone. So, like, how are we going to do this? 
so best thing we could do was we sat down and we just prayed. And we're like, God, you you bought these people here for a reason. They need to be here. So we trust that you're going to make a way for this conference to go ahead. And sure enough, it came to lunchtime and I'm there like helping the cooks and looking like, how are we going to get this food to go through all those people? And when they dish out their food, they, they give very generous portion sizes. So I was like, this is, they're filling their plates. I'm like, they're not going to be able to eat all this food. But all right, let's just see how it goes. But it just kept coming and coming and coming. I'm like, okay, great. And then people would finish, they'd sit in their groups and they'd eat. And I'm like, let's go get more. And they'd go. And I have a few groups of kids had like sevenths. It's how much food that they'd, they'd probably had come and hadn't eaten for a few days or, or at least just one small meal a day. And they come to this conference and it's just a banquet of food and it just kept coming. I'm like, God, you're amazing. This is incredible. And then, um, like, okay, is everybody finished? Everyone satisfied? Yes, we are. And then I looked over, went to the kitchen to the cooks and like, there's enough food still for us to go home and feed our families. So they, it was just incredible. Like, there was so much food left over, probably more than what we started with. So we knew in that moment that God was there and he was providing for these people that so desperately wanted to hear his word. And it was, yeah, it was the one word I could use to describe the whole week weekend was just, it was just, being in a God moment where you just never wanted it to end. And it's exactly how we felt walking away from it. We were not tired in the slightest. We're like, oh, we could have done this better. We could have done that better. But no, we were just like, let's just keep it going. But we couldn't. <laughs> um, so I've got just a very two-minute video snippet of, of a very small glimpse of what the youth conference was like. So please enjoy. So yeah, thank you for all those people that gave so generously to be able to put something so incredible on for the youth of Tonge and they're already begging for another one to come for 2022. So yeah, if that's something you'd like to consider helping support with, we can definitely look into that. So through, um, can I get the team back up now too? So through everything that we had been through, um, one thing that we had to learn to do was trust God, which it seems very easy to do on paper, but when 
you're faced with watching your husband nearly die and being locked out of your own country and having no way of being able to get home and not knowing what our future was. Um, trust was the one thing that was just continually having to be reminded of us. God just gave us an incredible peace when all everything could have gone wrong. Um, just reminding us to just constantly, you, you put your trust in me, I'm going to get you there. No matter what that looks like, that's in my control, but you just have to trust me. So that was what life became for us. Every morning we would wake up and we'd put our trust in God. And whatever that day brought, at the end of the day, our trust was still in God. So this next song is very reflective of um, what life was like for us. Morning by morning, we put our trust in God. So please stand and join with us in singing.
Thanks, guys. You can have a seat again. I will. Alright, I'll just do the Bible reading now. It comes from Isaiah chapter 43, verses 1 to 13. But now, thus says the Lord, He who created you, O Jacob, He who formed you, O Israel, Fear not, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by name. You are mine. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And through the rivers, they shall not overwhelm you. When you walk through fire, you shall not be burned, and the flames shall not consume you. For I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Saviour. I gave Egypt as your ransom, ransom, Cush and Seba in exchange for you, because you are precious in my eyes and honoured, and I love you. I give men in return for you, peoples in exchange for your life. Fear not, for I am with you. I will bring your offspring from the east and from the west I will gather you. I will say to the north, give up to the south. Do not withhold. Bring my sons from afar and my daughters from the ends of the earth. Everyone who is called by my name, whom I created for my glory, whom I formed and made. Bring out the people who are blind and yet have eyes, who are deaf yet have ears. All the nations gather together and assemble people. Whom among you then can declare this and show us the former things? Let them bring their witnesses to prove them right, and let them hear and say, It is true, you are my witnesses, declares the Lord, and my servant whom I have chosen, that you may know and believe me and understand that I am he. Before me no God was formed, nor shall there be any after me. I, I am the Lord, and besides me there is no Saviour. I declared and saved and proclaimed, And there was no strange God among you. And you are my witnesses, declares the Lord. And I am God. Also henceforth, I am he. There is none who can deliver from my hand. I work and who can turn it back. Thanks, Ben. Hello. Is that working? Can you hear me? Fantastic. And my PowerPoint's going. We are ready. Let me clear this. Well, good morning, family. We've got some interesting stories to share with you about South Sudan. Um, As you may or may not know, we have been in Australia for seven weeks now. And we've been in Mount Isa for four, so it's not long yet. We've, it's only been a little bit of time. Um, today we have been invited to share with you our mission trip to South Sudan, which ended up being a nine-month journey, as Sarah said before. And we travelled around the circumference of the earth. This is not an exaggeration. Distance-wise, the circumference of the earth is about 45,000 kilometres, and we travelled approximately 48,500 kilometres. Geographically, this is what our journey looked like. As you can see, we zigzagged around the circumference of the earth. This was completely 100% unexpected. Our initial plan was to go to South Sudan through Dubai, stay there for three months, and then return the way that we had came. But God had a different plan. Two days before we were due to fly out of Tonge, our flight was cancelled to Australia along with 40,000 other Australians who also stranded outside of their own home country. We added our names to our repatriation flight list, which was like playing the lotto to get seats. Then we were told that these repatriation flights were being redirected towards the Afghanistan refugees when the American soldiers were pulled out. We ended up doubling our time on the mission field, and we flew through Egypt, Switzerland, and stayed in America for a month in an attempt to return home. Just quickly, some information about South Sudan. 
It is the newest country in the world. It became an independent nation in 2011. Before that, it was one country called Sudan. And when they split, the southern part became a country called South Sudan, and the north kept the name Sudan. So they're two different countries now. At the end of our trip, South Sudan was named as the second most corrupt nation in the world. It has been named the third most dangerous country in the world because of the, the focus that rebels have on foreigners, on harming of the foreigners, sorry. In the 80s, the majority of northern Sudan were Arabic Muslims, while the majority of southern Sudan were Christian or animists. Animism is the belief that nature or the material universe has a soul or supernatural power. In the 80s, a civil war broke out as northern Sudan attempted a genocide on southern Sudan. What is a genocide? Well, Dr. Google will tell us that it is the deliberate killing of large numbers of people from a particular nation or ethnic group with the aim of destroying that nation or group. The Arabic Muslims of northern Sudan were even killing African Muslims in southern Sudan just because of their black skin. Because of this civil war, more than 50% of their population is under 18 years old. Because of the loss of the elder generation, much of the culture that is usually passed down has been lost. So what did the Beard family learn while we were on this mission field? To be honest, half an hour is not enough time to answer this. Even an hour. This time will not be enough to simply explain what God did through Sarah and me to even call us to go to South Sudan. That was a 16-year journey in itself. It's not enough time to share with you every testimony that we collected while we were on the mission field. And it's not even enough time to share with you the incredible things that God did every step of the way of helping us return from South Sudan back to here in Mount Isa. As our Bible reading said in verses 5 and 7, Fear not, for I am with you. I will bring your offspring from the east and from the west, and I will gather you, everyone who is called by my name, whom I created for my glory, whom I formed and made. However, today's Bible reading not only teaches this one thing, but it summarizes many of the lessons that we went through while on the mission field. We gained a deeper understanding when we used the word faith. We learned that God truly was sovereign and was guiding our every step. We learned that our work was quite useless, that really we were just witnesses to the mighty works that God was doing on the mission field. We learned that he was calling out to his children to come and be gathered. Within a week of being in South Sudan, God had given us our first resurrection story. The South Sudanese leader of the mission was on his way to work early in the morning. He noticed a grandmother walking on the side of the road, sobbing her eyes out while carrying a floppy baby. Moved by the compassion, he pulled the motorbike over and asked the grandmother what had happened. And the grandmother explained that the baby had been seizing for the last two days and then stopped breathing an hour ago. What could he do? He wasn't a medical professional, and he isn't a pastor. Silver and gold had he none, but all that he had he gave unto her in the name of Jesus, he prayed. And as he prayed, God brought life back to that baby. He then sent her home. However, when he shared his story with the health professionals at the hospital, we had to witness the story ourselves. So a group of us went around to their house and heard the testimony from the grandmother's mouth, to which we preached the gospel and God brought salvation to that whole household. Welcome to South Sudan. This was not the only resurrection testimony that God gave, would give us. Our second one was given to us in the last few weeks of our mission trip. Two non-Christian boys were in the field cultivating their crops. And during this time, it started to rain. The two boys started to walk home, and as they went that way, they had to walk underneath a tree. Lightning struck the tree and the two boys as they were walking underneath it, and they were thrown across the field. There were witnesses in little mud huts called tukuls that saw everything. All the people that witnessed the event ran over to these two boys who were lying in the mud. And when they rolled over the first guy, he was conscious, but he could not move or feel his legs. He could not walk. 
The crowd was a mix of Christians and non-Christians. And the Christians stepped forth and started praying for this boy. And as they prayed, God restored the boy's legs. And in no time, he was up and walking around with no deficits in the way he mobilized. However, when they ran to the other boy, he was not breathing. Again, the Christians stepped forward and started to pray for him. And as they prayed, God returned the breath to the boy's lungs and restored his life. The two non-Christian boys that were struck by lightning were up the front of the church on Sunday, declaring the awesomeness of God and sharing their testimony, which is the only way that we actually found out that this had even happened. As Acts 1 verse 8 says, But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in Judea and to the ends of the earth. Sarah and I learned the value of prayer. When people asked us, how can we support you? We always made prayer the number one answer. We constantly said to people, prayer is like a currency to us. It, is, it has become like gold. It is the most valuable thing that you can give us. As it says in Philippians 4 verse 6, Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And also in Colossians 4 verse 2, Devote yourselves to prayer, being watchful and thankful. Without prayer, we would not be able to stand up in front of you and share these testimonies. Because of prayer, we can. And let's be clear. These greatest miracle, the greatest miracle in these stories is not the resurrection of these physical bodies, but the resurrection of their souls. For in both, there were many souls that were dead in their sins, and Jesus stepped in and brought eternal life. In all four of the Gospels, we see in Scripture how Jesus physically and, was mirac- physically and miraculously resurrected. In John chapter 11, we see in Scripture how Jesus resurrected Lazarus with the power of God. In Mark chapter 4 verse 41, we see in Scripture how Jesus resurrected Jairus' daughter by the power of God. And in Acts chapter 9 verse 36 to 42, we see in Scripture how Paul resurrects Tabitha by the power of God. Hearing these testimonies in Scripture of God's activity is a blessing. However, witnessing the power of God's move today, this also was an amazing blessing. Sarah shared uh, during her testimony that they didn't have enough food to feed a whole youth conference of three to 400 people. However, they had tons of food left over. Does this remind you of any other miracles that occurs in Scripture? In Scripture, there are two stories where Jesus feeds 4,000 people and 5,000 people with under 10 loaves of bread in each story. And at the end of both, many baskets are filled with leftover food. And it doesn't stop there. In Mark chapter 5, verses 1 to 20, Jesus steps out of a boat and a demon-possessed man approaches him. The scripture explains how his family attempted to bind him, but he continually broke through his bondages. Eventually, he was driven to live amongst the tombs. God was working two similar miracles in Tonj, South Sudan. One day, a man stood up in front of the church to testify, I am free. For the last two years, he had been bound hand and foot in a hut because his family could not control his outrageous behavior. A month earlier, his family agreed to bring him to church, and the church prayed for him. There was no instant changes. However, over the next month, his family noticed that that he was a different man. His behavior was no longer outrageous until one day they decided to let him free. This was one of two stories about men who were tied up because of demons or outrageous behavior, and then they were set free after the church had prayed for them. It sounds like we walked onto the mission field and God's power was flashing left, right, and center. However, that's not what it felt like for us. In fact, these were rare cases in our experiences. Jonah and Destiny, the missionaries that this church supports who were over there in South Sudan, They told us that in the seven years that they had been there, they had never received a resurrection testimony or testimonies about people being tied up and then being freed. These testimonies rolled in during the small window that we were there. At the beginning, I shared how a baby was brought back to life. However, in the six months that we were there, 
we witnessed approximately 76 babies die in our hospital from malaria. Way more would have died outside of our hospital. Every patient that comes into our hospital hears the gospel and receives prayer. We could ask, why did you bring that one baby back to life and yet allow those 76 babies to die? However, managing these challenging questions boils down to us submitting to the sovereignty of God. As today's Bible's reading says in verse 13, I am God. There is none who can deliver from my hand. I work, and who can turn it back? With all the miracles that we, we were blessed to witness, there was also many trials for us to walk through. As our Bible reading says in verse 2, When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And through the rivers, they shall not overwhelm you. When you walk through the fire, you shall not be burned, and the flames shall not consume you. For I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. As you have heard in Sarah's testimony, I dangled on the edge of death with two anaphylactic reactions, even though I have never been allergic to anything. And as I came in and out of consciousness, I peacefully had a song going through my mind. Lord, you're more than enough for me. And that's why we have sung that song today. 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 9 and 10 says, But he said to me, My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore I will boast all the more gladly for my weaknesses, so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. For the sake of Christ, then, I am content with weaknesses, insults, hardships, persecutions, and calamities. For when I am weak, then I am strong. Whether I died there on the mission field or whether I lived to continue on in the mission field, God was always enough, and his grace was always sufficient. There were things that were not allowed to, we were not allowed to report while we were there on Facebook. Things like political or military-based information, it was forbidden. However, there was a day when a protest was planned in Juba against unsafe borders between Kenya, Uganda, and South Sudan. Bandits were attacking the trucks that were crossing the borders. In the past, coups began via protests that got out of hand. Therefore, the government put a show of power to scare the people from starting protests or coups. We were warned not to leave our houses, and tanks thundered down the street. Military vehicles with machine guns on the back patrolled the streets. A seven-day Adventist church decided that they would continue to gather for worship, and they were raided by military soldiers beaten and sent home. Fear was not felt during this demonstration of power, though. We have handed everything over to God in complete trust. The peace of God that surpasses all understanding will guard our hearts and our minds in Christ Jesus. Philippians 4 verse 7. Many people in South Sudan are struck by lightning each year. Where we live in Tonj, where we, sorry, where we live in Tonj, is right on the edge of the lightning bolt, which is primarily found on the Democratic Republic of Congo, our neighboring country. In one storm, lightning struck a tukul, and a wall fell over and killed a husband and a wife. However, on one day, Jono, myself, and two other South Sudanese had to travel to a far village called Macha to run a medical clinic. Macha means darkness and it is known as the witchcraft central of Tonj. It took us three hours to travel there because the road, or the path, was so rough, we were driving through houses, grass taller than us, and around cattle camps. And most of the time, there was no roads. The only way we knew where we were going was because the, the South Sudanese that were with us could recognize the trees that they were driving past. On this one day, we, complete, we completed the medical clinic by 4 p.m. under a tree. We treated approximately 300 people for malaria, and every one of them heard the gospel. Cows had been strolling through the medical clinic all day. A massive electrical storm rolled in on the path we needed to get home. We quickly hopped on the quad bike to race home, but there was no way to avoid that storm. About an hour in, we drove into the thick of it. We were saturated and cold. It was so windy that the raindrops were flying directly into our eyes, which stung our whole entire faces. So we had to drive slower to see where we were going, and most of the time we had to look down at our feet. But most of all, the lightning was striking 
bright, loud, and close. We were in a completely flat grassland with no tuckles around to hide in. The South Sudanese were complaining that this was the worst medical clinic that they had ever been on. And they were surprised that I was still singing worship songs, joking around, and smiling. Eventually, we drove into a village and we hopped off the quad bike and hid in someone's tuckle. I'm not sure what the purpose of that was. There were leaks everywhere in the roof and the floor was flooded from the leaks. But it gave us some sense of security from the storm. 45 minutes later and the storm passed. However, we had wasted so much time that we were starting to travel in the dark. This was a big no-no for us. The white missionaries were not allowed out of the compound in the dark for safety reasons. Even the South Sudanese felt unsafe traveling in the dark. As we got on the road again, we realized how strong the storm was. As we got on the road, there was about 70% of the trees that was on the sides, they had all blown on onto the road. We had to dodge them as we tried to get home. But God protected us. He pulled us through and he got us home safely. David sang this song in Psalms 135, verse 5 to 7. For I know that the Lord is great, and that our Lord is above all gods. Whatever the Lord pleases, he does, in heaven and on earth, in the seas and in, de all, in all deeps. He it is who makes the clouds rise at the end of the earth, who makes lightnings for the rain, and brings forth the wind from his storehouses. God is good. What blew our minds the most is how we could see the hand of God working in the timing of events. Sometimes this was over a long period of time, and sometimes it was in a small window. When I was a non-Christian, I promised myself that I would never be a missionary, because I had witnessed all the challenges that my missionary parents and grandparents encountered. However, when I gave my heart to Jesus in 2005, God clearly told me to become a nurse and go and live in the Philippines for a year. And I obeyed. I went to the Philippines to teach English as a second language. However, my students kept ending up in hospital, and I spent a lot of time caring for them. Through this, I was inspired to study nursing. And when I returned to Australia, I started studying nursing full-time while running a ministry part-time called Red Frogs. While running this ministry, I met one volunteer who would turn out to be the senior pastor of my sending church, Pastor Timothy Grant who is the pastor of this church, if you don't know. I also met another volunteer who would turn out to be my wife. While running this ministry, uh, before I proposed to Sarah, I said to her, missions is in my heart. You need to be willing to pack up everything and go to the mission field. And she said, I am. And I don't think we both realized what we were actually saying at that time. In 2007, while I was studying, I documented a dream in, in a journal that God was telling me that I would go and do work in the Philippines, India, and Ethiopia. Remember, South Sudan was not a country when I documented this dream. Sarah and I got married and moved to Mount Isa in 2011. In 2013, I went to India with this church to visit GHI, whom we support. In all my job changes, I always sat down with Sarah and asked, will this new position benefit the mission field? If we said no, we rejected jobs. And if we said yes, we accepted them. While I was working in the intensive care, I used to call upon two doctors in the emergency department to review my patients, and that was Jono and Destiny McLeod. As they reviewed my patients, they would tell me how they were studying and preparing to go and live in South Sudan. The seed was planted. Our church supported them, and we continued to follow them. In 2018, I became, uh, we became quite discontent with our life. We were unhappy with the inward focus of just working, paying bills, and doing the same routine while the majority of the world suffered and didn't know Jesus. We are in the top 15% richest of the world. The majority of the world are trying to survive on about $2 a week. We wanted to be more outward focused, and we had to do something. We agreed that it was time to return to what we agreed at the beginning of our marriage, to do missions for God. Where would we start? Jono and Destiny were the only people we knew, and so we contacted them. We set a date for 2021. And as you know, in 2020, 
COVID-19 struck the world and closed all the borders. And in our hearts, we closed the idea to that mission trip. However, Sarah and I started to pray, and we realized that we weren't really taking a step of faith. God can do anything. So we decided to push forward with the mission trip. Even with the COVID-19 pandemic going on, we needed to step out in faith and let God close the door for us, not just assume that the door is closed because man is responding to a pandemic. And guess what happened? God opened all the doors. It turned out that one of the reasons they would let us leave the country was because I was a nurse helping with COVID. God knew this in 2005 when I became a Christian and he told me to become a nurse. From our moment of discontentment, we also started contacting the Filipinos that I lived with in 2006. They had plenty of needs and we had nothing prepared for our trip to South Sudan. But we stepped out in faith and started helping these people in the Philippines. We preached the gospel. We helped people with hospital bills. We bathed people out of jail and paid for medication for family members. We continued to financially and spiritually support these Filipinos even while we were in South Sudan. These Filipinos heard all of our testimonies via Facebook and were encouraged in the faith. They also... They are also calling for us to start missions in the Philippines. Who knows what God has planned? What we didn't expect to hear, sorry, I should say who we didn't expect to hear from, was Sam from GHI. He contacted me from India. He shared with me how Africa was on his heart and he wanted to be a part of what we were doing. And even though they lived in Africa, he raised some funds and gave us a small donation, which absolutely blew us away. Remember my dream? Philippines, India, and Ethiopia. Some people may want to argue, but you are in South Sudan, not Ethiopia. They are neighbors, which is not the same thing. But this just leads me to my next story that shows that God is always in control. Before I left, I was working in the COVID-19 vaccination clinic. On my third last day, one of the vaccinators who I don't know walked up to me and said, you need to read Hospital by the River. It is a maternity book about missionaries in Ethiopia. Let, their last name is Hamlin. We did just that. Sarah and I bought the book and started reading it. And we finished it as we were driving from Man Isa to Brisbane so that we could fly to South Sudan. As we did a final Big W shop on the Sunshine Coast, the day before we left, we saw another book on a shelf called Doctor in Africa. We read the blurb and it was a by a doctor called Andrew Browning, who was, training, who was trained by the Hamlin missionaries in Ethiopia. He is an Australian doctor that works in Sydney. We said to each other, we have to read that book. But we bought the audio book so we could save space in the bags. As we listened to the book in South Sudan, we heard the stories about how Andrew Browning was trained in Ethiopia by the Hamlins to complete surgical procedures that fixed maternal fistulas. The Hamlins were not interested in leaving Ethiopia. However, Andrew Browning was interested in taking the surgical procedure right across Africa, and he did. We were reading this book in 2021, and in 2020, Dr. Andrew Browning had started a maternity fistula clinic in Juba, South Sudan. What is a matern maternity fistula? That is when a woman leaks fecal matter or urine from down below, caused by damage from delivering a baby. This was very embarrassing for them. Uh, husbands would often abandon their wives because of this. We asked Jono and Destiny if we see fistula patients in Tonge, and they said, no, we have never seen this presentation come out of our hospitals. At the end of the book, Andrew mentioned a system that powers hospitals using placentas. So we contacted him and asked him what this system was. And it turned out that we misunderstood that information. But he invited us to send fistula ladies to him. They would pay for everything, flights, accommodation, and even the surgery. We decided to put an end, uh, an end. We decided to put an ad on the radio asking for fistula ladies to come forward. And to our surprise, they started to roll in from the neck of the woods. We ended up sending 13 ladies to Juba and they all received successful surgeries. 
it turned out that we were providing over 50% of the patients in the clinic. And the 13 ladies that we helped, they knew many other ladies with fistulas, and they promised to go out into the villages and spread the word about this surgery. These surgery clinics ran four times a year. Who knew that God would use us and all these connections to help these ladies? When we returned to Australia, Vision Radio asked to interview us. And so we went in and got interviewed. The next day, we were listening to our interviews and they were advertising that after our section, they will be interviewing Dr. Andrew Browning. Honestly, do we put this all down to coincidence? God's mighty hand is always at work pulling things together. These events where we could see God intervening had just constantly been occurring the whole entire journey. Who knew, who knew that we would meet a nurse over in South Sudan who knew Carl and Lynn Weech, who are in this church? Her name was Annette. After I had my two anaphylactic reactions, I needed EpiPens. You can't buy EpiPens in South Sudan, and in America, each pen is worth $800. However, this nurse was able to bring me not just one, but four. And if I asked for those pens eight hours later, I would have none. The reason I was able to get them was because a missionary who was in Juba had to flee for her life, leaving everything behind. And so Annette had to pack up her luggage and send that to Germany back to her. And as she was packing her luggage, she found these EpiPens. So she contacted that German missionary, asked for permission to give them to me, and she said yes. And within the next two or three days, I had four EpiPens in case I had another anaphylactic reaction. But finally, my nursing job. Um, before I left, my job was to go around and interview nurses and make profiles about them as a way to advertise nursing in remote areas. One, this required me to travel out to all the different hospitals. And there was this one day where I went to the Cloncurry Hospital and I was interviewing these two nurses. Their names were Zach and Rebecca. And as I interviewed them, I said, why do you want to be a nurse? And they said, we are interested in working in developing countries. And I said, oh, what, what country are you interested in working in? And they said, South Sudan. I was like, wow, me too. Um, we're going to go move there next year. And they said, no way. We are too. Where are you going? And I said, well, we're going to Tonj. And they said, we're going to Tonj too. And I said, I'm like, I've got to ask, what organization are you going to work with? And they said, Indeed and Truth Ministry. So right there on this day, we had met two missionaries that we were going to live with in South Sudan in the next year. This was our confirmation that we were called to South Sudan. This can't be a coincidence. These were short-term contract nurses that had flown in from New Zealand to be there for only three months. As I said, we cannot fit everything into this time. However, you can see that God is always at work. Even when we do not think He is. Even when we want to put things down to coincidences. But He carries us along. He guides our paths. And when we let go of our illusions of control and just walk in faith on a wild journey, there is so much joy to be gained and so much glory to be given to God. It is so worth it. So where to from here? We are not 100% sure. We are aiming to return to South Sudan next year in April. We are thinking of doing a year here and then a year there, back and forth. But we don't know. There's a lot of our variables that have to be taken into account. But let's see what God does. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we just thank you for this uh, message that you have given us today, Lord Jesus. And we thank you for all of the work that you are doing in South Sudan, calling out the people that are uh, starving, that are hungry, that have not heard the gospel and opening up the doors so they can hear the gospel and have their eternal life changed, Lord. We ask that you pour out the Holy Spirit and your love on that land, Lord Jesus, and continue to bring people into your salvation and into your kingdom, Lord. We pray for Vida and her husband, Andrew, who are having a surgery this week, Lord. We pray that you'll be with them and you'll provide them with healing and comfort in these times, Lord. We pray for the Walden and Dumaji family 
who are going through issues at the moment, Lord. We pray that you'll bless them and you'll hold them up and give them comfort and strength and wisdom in what they are going through, Lord. We pray for the war that is going on over in Ukraine, Lord. We ask that you'll bring peace to that land, that the, the wars and the fighting and the death will stop, Lord, and that you will heal those, that land, Lord Jesus, and you'll bring unity. We pray for the persecutions that is going on in India, where the government is trying to shut down people that are Christian or preaching the gospel, Lord Jesus. We ask that, that you'll break down all those barriers, Lord Jesus, and all of that resistance that is going on. We pray that it melts away and that the gospel will be free to be preached again. We pray for all of our missionaries that this church supports, Lord, that are out there preaching the gospel and looking after people that are in need. We ask that you will provide for them, not just financially, but spiritually and mentally. We ask that you uphold them and you be with them and you carry them through everything, Lord. We pray, that you'll, we pray for this church that you'll put it in our hearts to love mission work, to go out and preach the gospel, to know that it is important to save souls in our community, near, far, and all the way to the ends of the earth, Lord Jesus. We ask that we make it our mission to get the gospel out into the world, Lord, we pray. In your name we pray all of this. Amen. Yeah, I hope you guys have enjoyed just hearing a very small glimpse of um, what life is like in Tonge. Um, I did have some gifts for the church, but I forgot them. So next week I'll endeavour to bring them. We've got a cross that's been hand carved out of the local mahogany wood um, and with gold bullet casings on it. Um, we've also got a scepre that um, was gifted to us that we wanted to give to the church. It, it was. It, People that think they have some kind of important significance in the community, they always carry around a scepter. Often you'll see um, chiefs or um, political advisors or anyone in, yeah, like a high political position. Um, so we have one of those for, for the church as well. So we just, again, want to thank each and every one of you for, for coming on this journey with us, for continually holding us in your prayers. Um, we know we, we couldn't have got through the time without it and um, we just ask that you continue praying for us as we figure out our next steps that God wants to take us on so yeah thank you we've got a couple of songs to finish with um, again these are probably new ones to the church so um, yeah the last song in particular is is a heart's cry that um, we want to see all God's children singing glory to his name and we believe that one day we will we will see that so um yeah please join with us and we will
Father, I do just um, praise and thank you for this time that we've come together to just be able to glorify with the works that you're doing, um, not just here in Mount Isa, but in and around the world, Lord. We know that you're a powerful God and that you long to see your people come to you, Lord. And we just long for a day too where we can be gathered together with all the people of all the nations, singing glory, glory, you reign. Lord, we just declare that day is going to happen. And we just will be in awe of you and worship you, Lord. So we just do thank you for this time that we can come together and just freely um, give this time back to you, Lord. We just ask that you go before us this week. Um, keep us safe um, wherever you may lead us this week. We think of the Grant family as they are currently now stuck in Brisbane, Lord, um, with all this rain around. I just ask that you keep everyone around the Brisbane area safe with all this um, water uh, around at the moment, Lord, and that um, you will just use this time for the Grant family to uh, rest in you and um, be able to draw their strength from you, Lord. And I just pray that you will bring them back to us safely in your time, Lord. We just ask this in your mighty name, Jesus. Amen. Thank you.